Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation and um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, on the event that is organized by Milos or Lex of Beauty or his talk. And uh, I always like to come to these events, although I should perhaps start with a disclaimer because this conference is for lexicographers and I'm not lexicographer. Uh, so yeah, perhaps I should have said that before you invited me, but anyways, uh, um, uh, I always been around lexicographers all my uh, professional life, but I do not consider uh, myself lexicographer. And so um, I uh, devoted the last five or so years of my life uh, for the study of uh, variation and registers. Uh, and so I thought it might be interesting to rethink all those concepts I've uh, gone through and I did for a check uh, from the perspective of lexicographers and from the pers pers perspective of someone who's writing a dic dictionary. And so um, I found it really fun and refreshing actually. And so I hope you will also enjoy uh, the few thoughts that I uh, that I put in this presentation, uh, because I really do not feel entitled to teach you how to write your dictionaries, because you're the professionals here. And so, um, just you know, a few thoughts about how things can might be done with respect to registers and how we label words. Actually, is this one working? Uh, yeah, it is working. So. Uh, Let's start with a simple, you know, obvious statement. We use corpora for several things. Um, uh, first of all, we use it for extracting meaning of units, and we know that we can extract typical, typical collocations, and obviously we extract the information about frequency. So why not uh, we extract, you know, the style or the usage labels, or the usage markers. I'll use these terms like synonyms, uh, like they are synonyms. So uh, is there a way how we can do this data-driven and perhaps um, uh, more linguistically informed way? Um, first of all, uh, there has been some discussion about um, uh, style and or yeah usage usage labels and we know that uh, there used to be this approach especially in the region of, of Central Europe, Europe and Slavic languages where the the, the um, uh, usage markers were to mark the va variety of language so if it is a part of a standard or non-standard language and we know that this is not a good idea because it is far from the data, it's basically, you cannot uh, do this data-driven way. And so uh, the other approach would be like to follow the communicative situations. We all know that corpora usually have metadata, so we can use it perhaps to find out if a uh, word is, say, part of the written language or the spoken language or whatever. But there are two... Uh, two questions or two problems connected to this communicative situation or to the usage of metadata to extract the, the usage labels. First of all, text types, as we know them, are connected to whole texts, and whole texts are usually mixtures of styles of re or registers. Take, for example, newspapers. What do you have in newspapers? There are interviews, mimicking spoken language, and then there are economy sections, which are more like analysis or exposition, and then uh, there are commentaries uh, uh, with all kind of, uh, you know, contemplative words and so on. And so uh, it is hardly to say, uh, you know, that something is typical for newspapers, that that's uh, uh, a usage label that can be used in a dictionary. And the second question is, what about if we want to use a corpus which, is, which does not have these kind of metadata? Take, for example, web crawl corpora. An uh, increasing number of uh, dictionaries are based on, on web crawl corpora, and they usually have very limited metadata. Basically, it's just you know the URL and when it was downloaded. And um, so is there a way how to uh, overcome both 
these two things and uh, to come uh, to usage labels in a data-driven way? I think there is, and the answer for me is to examine what I call registry affiliation of words. And I'll show you how it can be done. I haven't done it, <laughs> but I just explore the path. So uh, if there's anyone who can, who's willing to try it, you're welcome. But uh, this is just, you know, uh, a thought-provoking uh, uh, talk, not, not, you know, the, how things are really done. Uh, so uh, the outline of my talk would be that I would um, uh, first uh, say a few words about the multidimensional analysis and how we established registers for check. Uh, then I uh, would like to say a few words about how to measure the affinity of a lexeme to a register. And then there will be some few examples. You know, the point of a pudding is to eat it. And uh, in, in this case, the point of, of a methodology is to try at least that it works on a sample. So I hope you would not mind that most of the examples are in check. But since I know that lexicographers are really uh, you know, inclusive and very friendly environment, I, I hope you would not. Uh, so, uh, multidimensional analysis uh, uh, is something that is uh, connected to the name of Doug Biber, who started it back in 80s, actually, and uh, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, the, approach the approach to, to model, model systemic, systemic and functional, functional variability, variability as, as apart, apart from random, random or social linguistic, linguistic variability. variability. So this functional variability should be motivated by context or situation. Uh, it stems from the assumption that text production process involves interrelated choices. So when we uh, choose to use a one uh, linguistic item, uh, we also, by that choice, are forced to choose another one and so on. And so we know that, for example, passives are closely connected to a particular kind of situation and uh, then, then, for example, uh, usage of, of other formal means are also connected to passives and so on and so on. Uh, the, the output of multidimensional analysis are dimensions of variation and they represent this as we call it, intertextual perspective. So it's not about what the texts look like from, you know, from, from far, uh, like a novel is a book, a newspaper is something which is printed on, on a broad sheets of paper, uh, but it stems from the uh, linguistic means which are used in the text. Uh, the other output of multidimensional analysis is that we can establish registers. These are the clusters of text and they will be really important in this talk. Uh, another thing that is worth mentioning at the beginning uh, when, uh, when um, introducing multidimensional analysis is that it can be applied to other texts. So once you have a model for a language, you can apply the model to any text virtually to find out where in the dimension the text is and what is the register of the text. And that is important, especially for the data for which we do not have any metadata. So uh, when you, if, if you want to construct a multidimensional model of, say, check, uh, uh, you start with a corpus, then you uh, set a list of features, you operationalize them and extract, then there is some kind of statistical evaluation and interpreting the results, and then you end up with registers. So, how we did this in Czech? It's uh, something that I would not do by myself. It's a teamwork, and uh, as you can see, there are s um, five of my colleagues uh, who uh, collaborated on that uh, with me. And if you are interested in, in any part of this research, please visit those uh, this, this website, corpus.cz slash MDA, and all the important information is there. Uh, we've also published uh, the results on several, uh, in several papers, so you can also um, uh, use the, that as a, as a source of information. Um, so, in uh, uh, creating multidimensional model of variation in Czech, we inspired from the English examples, of course, but we also know that there will be some um, differences because we work in a Slavic language with uh, specific morphology, rich inflection, free word order, and so on. And also we knew that uh, there will be uh, some specific 
things connected to the Czech specific sociolinguistic situation which borders on diglossia. So we know that there is a difference between spoken and written Czech or uh, as some co someone would call it, the, the literary standard and the common, common Czech. Uh, the corpus we compiled for this uh, endeavor is uh, called Coditex and it is perhaps the most diverse corpus that was ever built for Czech. Uh, it consists of uh, uh, various uh, types of texts from written language to spoken language to web communication. It is not that large. It consists just about, it has some uh, 10.8 million words, but it is very, very diverse. It does not contain whole texts. It contains just chunks of texts and uh, they uh, are divided into a division and then further subdivided into 45 classes. Now the list of the, the, the categories is quite long and I would not go through this, but it, this is just to show you how diverse the, the corpus is. So the first, uh, the first row is for spoken language, then the internet communication, and then there is this wide range of categories for, for written language, including um, private correspondence, not just, you know, the, the, the official things, just, as you know, fiction, newspapers, non-fiction, but also the private correspondence. So we have this very, very diverse corpus, and then uh, we compile a list of features. Now, uh, the list of features can be virtually anything that participates in functional uh, uh, variation in the language. So we started with a list of 140 features, then we had to trim it down to 122 because some of the features were we, are, we were not able to operationalize or they were too erroneous. And so uh, the, the, the features are from, from phonetics, so uh, features of, of uh, uh, distinguishing, say, um, formal and informal language, morphology, derivation, obviously lexicon, lexical features, uh, but uh, yeah, we tried several uh, lexical classes, for example, you might think of uh, lexical classes such as vulgar words, but then we realized that it is not that simple to compile a list of vulgar words, but uh, that, that's not the, 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 the real problem here. The real problem is that if you take uh, the, the diversity of, of texts in the corpus, you'll find out that uh, most of them, and I would say like 90% of them, would not contain a single one. So that's not a feature that helps you distinguishing texts from each other. Um, pragmatic syntax and text and discourse features, all sorts of features. Uh, then uh, when you operationalize them, you get a large table containing, uh, I don't know how many, uh, 3,292 3, texts. These are the, the, the rows in the table and each column represents one feature and there were like 122 features. This table is submitted to a statistical evaluation, the methods called factor analysis. That gives you a lot of, a lot of information, but most importantly, it gives you the, the factors or the, the latent factors as the st as statistical s statisticians would call it. And we in, in multidimensional analysis or register studies call it dimensions of variation. Now these dimensions are to be interpreted and these interpretations are based on two types, two pieces of information. One is loading and the other is factor score. Uh, loading is basically the information about the features, how the features are relevant for a particular dimension. Factor scores are information about text, so where the texts are on this particular dimension. So these are the two pieces of information that we used for labeling the dimensions. And finally, we came up with this list of eight dimensions and the labels are the, uh, the things that we've derived from the data, so that they are made up. Uh, the, the, the most important dimension in the Czech, and not only in Czech, it, it turns out that that's 
perhaps uh, uh, you know language general uh, thing, a universal thing that most languages has some kind of dimension that uh, distinguishes dynamic texts and static texts. Uh, these are texts which are either verbal heavy or noun heavy, or we may also translate it as a um, clausal principle or phrasal principle. So if you want to add a new information, you either add a new clause, and by adding a clause, you also add a verb, or you add, you elaborate on, on a nominal phrase. So you do not add a new verb, a new clause, but you add nouns. So that's, that's, the, that's the major, the, the, the most important dimension. The second most important dimension is the second one, spontaneous versus prepared. That's the difference between hit and miss coding and carefully worded formulations. Now, uh, I would not go through all of them, but, um, uh, the they are not ordered in the uh, in the extent to uh, to which they uh, uh, represent the variation or th yeah they explain the variation. But uh, I should also mention the fifth dimension, which is the distinct uh, distinction between higher and lower amount of addressee coding. So whether the communicative partners explicitly. Uh, address each other, which we do not do that often in conversation. For example, we do not do that at all uh, because we know to whom we are talking. Uh, so the most uh, the, the 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 texts which are really uh, uh, which has a higher level of addressee coding are screenplays because uh, if you look at a drama, you want to know who's speaking to whom. So they address themselves a lot. And finally, the eighth dimension is also an, an important one, attitudinal versus factual. So the degree of uh, like a explicit epistemic certainty, that's, that's something uh, uh, that distinguishes texts which are attitudinal and factual. So uh, if you look at, for example, the first one, first dimension, uh, where the texts are on this dimension, you'll find out that uh, the, most, uh, the most dynamic texts are romance novels. Yeah, they're very, very verbal heavy. Uh, a lot of clauses. And then uh, there are letters, private letters, web forums, crime novels, elicitated speech. So uh, mostly, Two, two types of text, basically narration and then like uh, something which is close to spoken or yeah, spoken conversation. On the other hand, the most static texts are administrative texts, scientific te texts from uh, technical sciences, encyclopedias, texts from uh, natural sciences, Wikipedia articles and so on and so on. If you look at the features which are like relevant for this first dimension, you can see that most of the positive loading features are the features which are related to, to verbs like past tense verb, finite verbs, uh, indicative forms, third person pronouns, also uh, something that is related to, to verbs. On the other hand, negative loading features are mostly nouns or things which are related to nouns, such as adjectives, uh, noun pre-modifiers, and so on and so on. So this is how we uh, uh, knit it, how we made the, 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 the label dynamic versus static. On the other hand, if you look at the second dimension, uh, the, the most spontaneous uh, text type, so to say, in our data was private conversation here. Then, and then there was this elicited speech, broadcasted discussion on TVs and radios, and then with a larger gap, uh, there, are, there are screenplays. They are mimicking, to some extent, the, the spontaneous conversation, but it is not that uh, <laughs> spontaneous, as you would see, uh, think. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the prepared uh, extreme of, of, uh, of the corpus uh, is, uh, uh, that there are text, administrative texts, Wikipedia texts, uh, scientific texts from technical sciences, and so on and so on. So uh, this is one piece of information from which we've 
uh, decided to name uh, this dimension spontaneous versus prepared. The other piece of information was the features. And again, uh, the positive loading features are those features marking interactivity or informality or uh, they are conventionalized non-standard common Czech morphological variants, which are those things which are symptomatic of Czech diglossia. If you put these two dimensions together, you get this wonderful picture. Uh, each point represents one text, and the blue ones, the blue ones here are non-fiction, the, the orange ones, which are almost invisible in the center, are newspapers. Yellow are fiction text. Pink ones are letters. And the black ones here are the spoken informal language. As you can see, there, are clear, there is a clear separation between those texts, which are below this, uh, this line, so to say, and which are below this line are the, the, the written ones above are the spoken ones. So this is basically the map of Czech diglossia. Uh, but uh, let's move on. I'll skip uh, fifth and uh, eighth dimension, and I'll tell you something about the applications of that, because that's why are we here. Um, there are basically two things which we can do once the multidimensional model for a language is established. The first one I've already mentioned, and that's called the additive MDA. Uh, and that's the fact that any, any text of a language can be analyzed through this model. So we can apply the same set of features. We can find out how many passives, how many, I don't know, nominative cases are there in the text. And then from these numbers, we can calculate uh, what is the position of the text on any dimension, how spontaneous it is, how dynamic it is, what is the amount of addressee coding in it. And uh, that's important because uh, that way we can uh, add to a text which was, for example, downloaded from internet, uh, we can add some kind of linguistic information about the register it has. Um, so uh, that's one thing that we will use later on. So please keep that in mind. And the second application of MDA is establishing registers. I've just talked about dimensions and most multidimensional analyses end with dimensions because that's, you know, that's uh, the, the, the ultimate goal for many of them uh, because what you want to describe is the variation of a language and you do not care about the, the categories in it. But uh, from the dimensions and from the position of individual text on the dimension, you can actually create a classification, a, register, a list of registers in a language. So uh, first, let me uh, say uh, some vague definition what a register could be. Register could be a variety that would be defined by two things. Uh, one would be the set of distinct pervasive and functional linguistic features. So that's the position on a dimension. And second, that would be the communicative situation. So both two things are interrelated in the concept of register. To operationalize this definition, we would just simply uh, take all the texts on all dimensions and cluster them together to find out which texts share the share some um, linguistic features. The, the rationale of, this, of that is that texts which are close together um, uh, in, in the multidimensional space are linguistically similar. You know? It is hard for us to uh, imagine an eighth dimensional space, but believe me, it is not a big deal for mathematicians and they can easily calculate distances even in a in an eighth dimensional space. So we can find out how texts are far from each other and from that we can actually create clusters, groups of texts which are similar. And we did that. And uh, we came up with 10 registers and we decided to divide them uh, 
um, according, uh, yeah, uh, we decided to divide it into two groups based on the first dimension, which was the most important one, the dynamic versus static. So we have five static registers, five dynamic registers, and uh, we uh, decided to name them uh, according to the, uh, the say, the, the, the most important uh, feature and the uh, according to uh, the dimension on which they had like the extreme value. So the static register, static registers are analysis for us, that's a static monothematic register. So if there is anything special on, anal uh, if there is anything special uh, for analysis, it is the monothematicity of this register. Uh, popularization, that's a static register also, but it is polythematic and general, so it does not take about. Uh, it does not speak. Uh, it does not speak about the particular things, but it is quite general. Uh, then uh, uh, the third register is journalism, uh, which is indeterminate. That's you know the problem of journalistic texts that they mix together things, and fifth, fourth of them, uh, fourth of the registers uh, is facts static, polythematic, and particular. So the difference between facts and popularization is in the fact that popularization uh, speaks in general about things. So for example, Wikipedia articles defining what a football is, you know, that it is a game for, you know, 22 players um, and so on. That would be uh, that would be popularization. Whereas if you have a Wikipedia article saying who was in the team when Germany obviously won, uh, uh, then uh, that would be facts because that's particular. That's not general. Uh, argumentation is a static register that is cohesive. So apart from all those static registers, this one is specific by its cohesiveness. Uh, dynamic registers are question answering. So if you answer a poll, for example, a survey, uh, uh, what is specific is that it is a spoken language, so it's kind of dynamic, it is unprepared, but what is specific about question answering is that you do not use, uh, did you do not address your communicative partner. Uh, you do not have to. Uh, and it turns out that that's really a specific thing about question answering. Conversation, on the other hand, is the most spontaneous one. Commentary is the attitu attitudinal one. Screenplay is the, the register in which we do address the partner. And narration is the one which is the most retrospective. Now, this may sound like a lot of categories, and I do not expect you to, to uh, remember all of them, but... Uh, um, it's just uh, that you have a vague uh, notion about these 10 registers because I'll use them later on. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a chart uh, of all the registers and it can be really, really, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, hard to read. Uh, but uh, if you follow nine, for example, here, nine, you know, uh, that's the narration and uh, uh, the, position of the nine in the graph represents where the narrative register texts are on this dimension. So on the first dimension, it is quite high, so it is a dynamic register. Then in this uh, dimension, it is, quite, it is quite average. Here it is also quite high on the fifth dimension, which is the address coding. It is, uh, you know, uh, it has some kind of addressing, but not as much as screenplays. Uh, but what is specific about nine is that it is really retrospective. On seventh dimension, it is retrospective. So that's that's how we labeled them, the registers. And finally, I'm getting to lexicography. <laughs> uh, so um, now uh, I'm leaving my safe space and uh, I'm uh, going to your safe space. Uh, and uh, what can these registers tell us and how can these registers be used in uh, compiling a dictionary? So, um, mostly I'd say that uh, we tend to uh, prefer usage 
usage-based approach. And so we would like to have the we would like to have the labels data driven. And if you think it through, uh, and you can call it whatever you want, preference or affiliation or affinity of words to a register, it is something that can be converted to association. So is there an association between a word and the register? Uh, if there is, uh, perhaps we can use something we already know. We already know that there are associative measures. We already know that there are associations that we used for measuring collocations. That's association between two words. So why not, uh, why not using association measures and uh, to find whether there is a preference for a word to be in certain register. So is there a way to adopt association measures based on frequency uh, to, to measure this kind of affiliation? I'll uh, use two of them, a my score, bec because that's the one I learned the first. The, the, this is the oldest for, for me. And log dice, because I'm here, the lexical computing. And uh, um, uh, the, the, um, that's, that's uh, the, the association measure that is used in Sketch Engine. Well, uh, we all know this formula for MI score, which is quite simple, and that's used for collocations. So uh, if we want to find out what is the association between words X and Y, uh, we calculate this formula, we have the MI score, but we can simply transform it into this form, and uh, so that, that this, this particular thing would be read as the occurrences of the word X in register R. And so on, and this would be this would be the, the the total number of tokens in the register R in the corpus. Uh, similarly, we can transform log dice to to this form that will be used not for two words but for a word and a register. So that's not a, not a big deal. Uh, it's it's quite simple. So let's look at the results, and I'll show you just you know samples. Uh, these are top three association for top three register I just came across. So analysis for log dice is like and in B for question answering this B that for argumentation and B and reflexive pronoun. That's not you know that's not going to work. Uh, it's perhaps too common. These are too common words. You know you 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 would not say that there are like that they prefer this particular registers. If you look at MI score, uh, we have this opposite problem. <laughs> they are too specialized. So inspector, hunt, shredding for analysis. Yes, we can think about analytical texts that they are about, you know, inspecting things, but you know, uh, I would not say that if I listed a word inspector in a dictionary that I would find that this word is particularly specific for for analysis. Or, you know, uh, the filler, well, nyak, like somehow or something like that. Uh, for argumentation, trust, turning, dragging, well, yes, they can be used in argumentation, but they are not too specific. That That's not what I had in mind. And uh, what we see here is, you know, uh, again, the problem that MI score prefers low frequency words. We all know that. So that's not, that's, that, that's not something that we would not expect. It. What might be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, unexpected is the, the results from log dice, because we know that log dice works pretty well for, 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 for lexical collocations. And uh, the problem here is that there is a uh, disproportion between frequency of any word, basically, and the frequency of the register. So these two numbers are quite far from each other. And so we can come up with a solution how to compensate for this. Uh, for this. And so I did a simple, very simple modification. Instead of frequencies, I just used texts or the numbers of chunks uh, in the corpus. So MI score would, would look like this. It's not just, you know, it's, it's not the frequency, it's number of texts where the word X appears in register R uh, uh, times the number of texts in the corpus. And these are the number of texts where the word X appears and number of texts of the register R. And similarly for log dice, and as you can see in the tables, the results are much better. 
not for MI. It is somewhat, still somewhat problematic for MI. <laughs> But LogDice looks really promising. Uh, so for analysis, what would you think if I say that for the register analysis, whatever it is, you know, whatever is hidden behind the label analysis, uh, that there, there are words like relevant, mentioned, like above mentioned, stated. Well, that sounds, sounds quite nice. Or the question answering the filler is over there still. Uh, then let then somehow, yeah, that's that's more or less the same. But argumentation again, do sledek, consequence, process, meaning, that's something these are the words that I would expect to be used in argumentation. So yeah, it might it might work. Now the problem with Coditex, the source corpus I used for this table is that it's quite small. It's like 10 million words only. So let's apply the multidimensional model to a larger corpus, to corpus since 2015, which has 100 million words, but just the written check, no, no, no spoken, no online communication. So uh, now we have a broader context, and I'll show you just you know just a taste of 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 what can be done with this uh, association measures applied to to registers. Uh, so argumentation, the static cohesive uh, register, uh, the most uh, associated words for argumentation would be concept, consequence, theory. Process, general, phenomenon, given, certain, principle, if, example, viewpoint, aspect, assumption, general. I did not filter this list at all. This is just what came out from the corpus. That's, you know, no filtering, no, nothing. Uh, and I think that it is pretty convincing because that's what I would expect the argumentation would contain. Uh, again, screenplay. Screenplay is a dynamic uh, uh, register with a lot of addressy coding and mimicking spoken conversation. So then, sorry, shit, hey, yeah, damn, that word, look, uh, see, today, your, huh, oh, stare, hi. Again, I think uh, that it is pretty uh, good for, you know, automatic methods. Just, uh, you know, few few minutes of playing with numbers uh, and perhaps the, the last one narration ask face door eye shoulder hear uh, hair your answer voice sit raise this smile you know uh, I realize that smile is something that you would not expect in in journals that much or in non-fiction texts that's something you would expect from a fictional text from narration so yeah um, the question is whether these labels are relevant to users. Well, uh, uh, hopefully I'll get to this one uh, at the end. But um, uh, my other empirical verification of this process or this method is that I wanted to find out if there is a way how to, uh, how to verify the labels after they were used. So normally, the lexicographers establish labels and they uh, do the analysis, they write the dictionary, and then uh, what if we take the words with the labels to find out if the labels actually fits our expectation. And so I did this. I did this for a Czech dictionary that is currently being compiled at the Czech Language Institute in Prague. It's called um, Akademický slovník současné češtiny, Academic Dictionary of Contemporary Czech. Uh, so far they've published uh, several letters from A to G, so it's not a, the whole dictionary, it's just, you know, the, the beginning of the alphabet. But what is, uh, what is really uh, great about this interface is that you can simply filter out all the words that has a certain usage label. And so I've uh, extracted those words which are already been published uh, uh, and they have this style characteristics. Colloquial, that's what they use. And they also have this specific really long <laughs> description, colloquial with a tendency to become neutral. So these are two separate categories. 
colloquial, and colloquial with a tendency to become neutral. Uh, then there are slang and professional terms. There are also vulgar expressions, but I would not show you the results for this for this category because there were too few occurrences in the corpus. Basically, that's you know the the problematic part of of any you know, of this part of, of lexicon, basically, because we do not have the data, and I should not explain that to you, because you already know that better than I do. Uh, pejorative words, similar to vulgar expression, but I did find some, some examples in the corpus, so I'll show you the results. So, the question, the research question here is, given this style characteristics, these labels, where can we typically find them? So, and do these uh, labels, you know, meet our expectations? So uh, I took the colloquial words, and uh, for each word, I find out what is the most associated register uh, to this uh, to this word in the Coditex corpus, because the Coditex is a diverse corpus, so it contains conversations and all kind of specific um, registers. And I find out that most of the colloquial words were on in, in register which we called commentary. So that's something you do on online when you comment on someone's uh, opinion or if you comment on, uh, on a product or a movie or something like that. Uh, the, the second uh, largest category is the words that are uh, mm, associated with narration, screenplay, and conversation. So screenplay and conversation are really the spoken ones, basically. Narration is something that is close to that. It's not, it's not spoken, but it is close to that. And uh, journalistic text is fifth. So these are the colloquialism, and I was really uh, interested, or yeah, I, uh, um, I did not expect, to be honest, to find a difference between colloquialisms and words which are colloquial with a tendency to become neutral, but there is. It turned out that the authors of the dictionary were pretty right that they distinguished these two categories uh, because the, the, the words that are labeled colloquialism with a tendency to become neutral, despite the fact that it is really hard to say it, <laughs> Uh, it is a good category uh, because most of them are associated with journalistic text, so they are used a lot in the public discourse. You know, recall the 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 the, the previous one where the journalism was fifth. Now uh, these colloquialisms are much more used in the public discourse uh, than than the previous ones. Uh, they are also used in commentary, but they are also used in factographic literature, so in 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 a literature where we summarize the facts, and then narration, popularization, and so on and so on. So this is uh, something that was. Uh, not expected. I did not expect to find the difference, but there is a difference. So, uh, kudos to uh, the colleagues at the uh, Czech Language Institute. Uh, uh, slang and professionalism. Uh, these are the, there are very few of them. Just you know, 57 words, and most of them um, are uh, associated with a register which is called facts. It's not a surprise. Uh, and then journalism and popularization. So yeah, it works. It it you know um, uh, kind of meets the expect ex expectations. And finally, pejorative expressions. I had to look look it up in in larger corpus because there was like almost nothing in in ten million corpus like Coditex. And uh, we find out that most of the pejorative expressions are in narration and secondly in journalism and screenplay. So yes, again, that's something what we would expect. But on the other hand, it shows us that for these parts of language, we would not have the data we would like to have, even though if even even with the, the the spontaneous conversations, we do not have the data for you know really vulgar and pejorative things because nobody would give you, you know, transcript of their argument with their partner and so on. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm um, uh, almost at the end. And uh, throughout the talk and throughout the, uh, mostly the, the part where I presented the results, maybe you had the same question in mind. And that's the question whether the users of the dictionaries actually would want to have these kind of labels. If, if it is something that is like uh, attractive to uh, to users, and uh, 
I think the, it, it translates, uh, at least for me, to uh, a more general question that Miloš already pointed out in his, in his uh, uh, introduction, and that's what are the usage labels? Are, the, are they warning signs, like do not go there, do not say that because, you know, otherwise it will be like really bad for you? Or are they like descriptions of where the words live? Um, and this is a part of a more general term, a more general question actually, because it is parallel to prescriptive and descriptive approach. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the question whether we would like to, uh, you know, uh, describe what we have in the data, or if we want to meet the expectation of, of, the, uh, of the users of the dictionary. And, um, you know, we know that users especially in our regions uh, demand the prospective prescriptive uh, usage labels uh, because uh, frankly uh, we taught them to do so for decades so uh, it's not a big you know surprise that they want this kind of uh, you know uh, treatment from from the dictionary but uh, I believe that the descriptive approach is something that is preferred by empirical linguists. And so I would not deal with this question uh, more because uh, since we do not have any data that will allow us to judge and decide which language, you know, mean which word is, is correct and which is incorrect, uh, we, we should stick to those t pieces of information that we have in the data. And so the data-driven descriptive approach can be based on, and I, hopefully I, I demonstrated that it can be uh, uh, based on text linguistic approach, the multidimensional analysis to variation, which uh, allows us to uh, um, establish registers based on linguistic features, and that can give us a more objective labels. Uh, what I found really interesting is that this approach is applicable to uh, any data. Basically, uh, once you have the model for the language, you can download the data from the internet and simply assign a register to, to the data by uh, applying the uh, uh, additive MDA. Um, it can be also used for the post hoc check of the label, so we can find out whether our you know, labels uh, meet the expectations we had for them. And uh, I also wanted to show you that the concept of association can be extended from the lexical level to other domains, which can be potentially also interesting to other applications. And this is the end of my talk, and I thank you for, uh, for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Vasov. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, we don't have much time, so I would start the discussion right away. Um, questions from the audience? If I don't have one, I'll start immediately. Uh, Thanks for your talk. I was wondering in the beginning, you said that uh, you did not use full text in the corpus, but chunks of text. So uh, could you please elaborate on that? Um, yes, uh, that's uh, that's a, um, an important decision that we made. Uh, first, uh, uh, it was motivated by the fact that we wanted to have the corpus as diverse as possible. So, uh, with 10 million words, if you uh, if you want to have a lot of text in it, you have to chunk. Uh, the other thing is that we knew that uh, most of the texts are, especially the larger one, are mixed register-wise. So. It is uh, complicated to write a novel in one register. Usually, you start with a narration, then there is, you know, uh, the, the, the characters speak to, to each other, and then there is a description, and then perhaps there is some kind of uh, contemplative part. So it is uh, difficult to to uh, mm, uh, to write a larger text in one register. Whereas if you chunk it to say three thousand words you reduce this mixture of register because each 
chunk is more pronounced register-wise than any larger text would be. Um, and so that 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 was that that was our uh, motivation for that. Uh, the other thing is that for multi-dimensional analysis and for other analyses, a text is a unit. So uh, you have to calculate all those features per text, per text chunk in our case. So to say, so we had to do this because otherwise, uh, larger texts would, um, you know. Um, uh, the, the, the frequencies of the features would level out, will, will be like average because it would be like the mixture of, of, of register within, within, within the larger text. If I'm answering your question. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I wonder how stable all of these analyses are because dictionaries, you can't rewrite them every year. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, it seems because you use exploratory factor analysis, the, the dimensions you discussed, they're somewhat different from the Biber dimensions. So Biber at five dimensions, you have eight, for example. So because it's exploratory factor analysis, that it depends on the corpus and uh, what the dimensions will be, and hence what the registers will be. You can tell because you you miss a few uh, registers relative to the to the dictionary, right, with the, the square words and all of that. So is it stable enough for to be the basis for labeling in a dictionary, or is it too dependent on the corpus? Yes, first of all, um, um, when we presented the dimensions and in our interpretation to Doug Biber, he like immediately found that there are striking similarities, you know, to, to his five dimensional model. So there are uh, some differences. We have eight dimensions, but you know, that's the, the, the analysis is perhaps more fine grade. We have larger data than he, he had and um, more computational power than he had in 1988, you know. Uh, and so, um, uh, so it is uh, stable, uh, the analyses of multi-dimensional analyses of different languages reveal that there are uh, some tendencies like universal, for example, the, the dynamic static, despite the fact that they are labeled differently. So that's one, uh, one answer. Uh, the other would be like, um, uh, diachronically stable, if you're asking me like if it is stable in, in time, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd say uh, that uh, in those parts, uh, like conversation or online communication, uh, the development is much faster than for the written part. And, you know, those registers mostly uh, uh, mostly related to, to written language would be more or less stable in time. The, the spoken might spoken part might change, but I'm not sure. Uh, well, um, in, a, in a sense, uh, it is not different from meaning, for example. I'd say uh, if you uh, compile a dictionary today, and then later, a um, year, 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 year on, uh, you'll uh, compile a new corpus, look at the same words, you'll probably find out that there are some shifts uh, as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much. This was really great. I really appreciate it. Um, I, my question is, so in your article, you talked about um, your feature selection a little bit, um, where you said that you you use check monographs and dictionaries and or or grammars and probably your native speaker intuition. Um, but could you maybe speak a little more about your feature selection? Did you also were you um, maybe inspired or informed by Biber's features? Uh, y yes, you already answered. Yeah, we were inspired by by original Bible set, although some some English features were not applicable to, to Czech. Uh, and then then uh, we did uh, you know extensive study of all the stylistic books and grammar books of Czech and so on. And uh, but you know the bottleneck of the analysis is how um, uh, reliable 
the operationalization could be. And so uh, for several features, we have to you know, resign because it, it was impossible to uh, uh, operationalize the features in a uh, reliability that we want to have. Uh, we did uh, uh, afterwards uh, a double check. So we hired students to label whether, uh, for example, all passives in, in this text were labeled and we found out which features were reliable, which were not. And so we decided those unreliable to, to uh, uh, remove from the analysis. So that, that was the bottleneck. And uh, the other one was, uh, I also mentioned that the fact that some features we thought would be interesting, like for example, the vulgar words, but then it turned out that it distinguishes very little because they are used in so few texts, like less than 10% of the corpus. And so it doesn't make sense to uh, have a, a feature that is relevant just you know, for a teeny tiny part of, of the corpus. Any other questions from the audience at the moment? Do we have any questions online? No, good. I've, I've got a question. So uh, in terms of uh, usability or usefulness of the usage labels that you, that you, um, that you discussed, um, I think one part would definitely involve whether you would be able to rewrite the name of the registers in the dictionary or when the dictionary is used into a form that would be more like, um, you know, not narration, but you typically use the, this word when, and then you know describe the, the register in a few you know words or maybe in one sentence. Do you think this would be possible for all the registers as they are there? Like I'd like to, to you know to explain them to the dictionary users in a simple way. I um, haven't thought about that. So let's look at the list of uh, uh, sorry registers. Um, I think that most of the labels are self-explanatory, like analysis, everybody know what analysa in Czech is, uh, although uh, perhaps um, uh, some uh, more detailed explanation would be required. Uh, but for example, conversation, uh, screenplay, narration, these are like, you know, the, the, the things that more or less are in, 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 in uh, the, uh, uh, general language, so I hope that that, that users would y would understand them. Uh, the problem is maybe with those things like journalism and facts, because frankly speaking, these two are like too indeterminate. They are like mixture of things, and we all we we know that. Uh, we labeled them that way because we know that majority of journalistic text actually falls into this category. So uh, uh, mm, that's that's the problem because you know in newspapers there are a lo lot of things and uh, um, and they are quite diverse. So they kind of average and, and level out all all those specificities. So it's it's just you know the indeterminate indeterminate register. I'm not saying that all of the labels are usable, but I uh, just, you know, that, that was just, you know, uh, just a suggestion. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? If not, then we thank you again, Václav. Thank you very much. Also for the perfect timing, which makes it possible for us to enjoy the coffee break now. Thank you.